two, three, testing. So who looks familiar? Like him or me? Well, him too. Well, yeah, I'm around the village quite a lot. Yeah. And I go to Republican events and uh, record stuff. Testing and one, two, three. Generally make trouble. Yep. I saw your picture the police station. Yeah, that's probably about that.
donate this old barn to the town, and the townspeople got together in true New England fashion and completely refurbished it, took it apart on her property, sent it up to Maine to have them do a bunch of stuff to the timber, brought it back down here. They sold tanks to raise money to put this together as a true community project. The selectmen at the time also invested, and a lot of people made a lot of significant donations. This exemplifies, I think, the true spirit of New Hampshire. The fact that we are seated in a paid for, completely restored barn, which has become by default sort of the community center for many of our activities. The seniors are fed here once a week. We have all kinds of meetings, whether it's the scouts or whether it's other groups. And tonight, it is my privilege as the chairman of the select board to welcome you all here. Uh, for a, what I hope will be a very informative, robust uh, discussion and debate among four obviously wonderful candidates who are all residents of our community. Uh, I want to take this moment to introduce them to you and then I'm going to ask Chris and John, who are two veterans here, uh, to stand up after I do the introductions and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. After that, I would like you to remain standing while my beautiful bride will sing the national anthem, okay? On the far end is Donna LaVasseur. Donna lives just up the road a piece, that way, that way, yeah. And uh, Donna has decided it's time for her to get engaged in uh, local politics at the state level. So we're delighted for her involvement. This is the first time I think you've run for public office. So we're looking forward to hearing all about you and what makes you tick and all the exciting things you want to accomplish. Immediately to her left is no stranger to all of us, Jim Belanger, our current town administrator, a member of the BFW in good standing. Uh, not town administrator, town moderator. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> well, the job hasn't been filled yet, so if you want to apply, Jim, we'll, we'll see. Uh, uh, Jim's a, a, a good friend and, and a good man in our community. I think this is his 20th year, roughly, being up in Concord. No, um, this is my age. Eight, eight year, I'm sorry. But how long have you been involved in the town? I think you were one of the police. I think you were also like a fireman. I was 22 years in the police department, 25 years in the fire department. 22 years police, 25 years fire. 270 years if you let them Yeah. <laughs> so he's been around a while and he's seen things come and go. We're delighted Jim's here. Immediately to his left is Carolyn Gargas, who I think is 18, 19. 20 years, how many years have been conquered? Nine terms. Nine terms, so 18 years, and you're going for the magic 20. Yeah. And she has been a fixture in Concord for many years, involved a lot in children's health issues um, and women's health issues, and a lot of concerns about education, um, medical care, etc., cetera, for, for people in our community. So thank you for your service. <laughs> I look forward to hearing some thoughts that you're going to share tonight. Immediately to your left is the Honorable Dr. Jim Kelly, medical doctor, also a member of the local BFW Post. I haven't seen a lot of him around this summer because he was on deployment in some lousy country in the Middle East or <laughs> something in Afghanistan or something like that, mixing up people who get wounded. Um, your service to our country is immeasurable. We owe you an extraordinary debt of gratitude, Jim. So thank you for your service as well. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts what's going on in the State House, and how we can all make New Hampshire a more wonderful place to live um, with our unique form of self-governance here. With that, I would like to invite John and Chris to please stand and lead all of us. Please stand. In the please rise and join allegiance. us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. So gallantly free. 
parts of different towns. Um, I think they created that, what, three or four years ago? Something like that. Yeah, redistricting. And then I also want to recognize a dear friend, Senator Peggy Gilmore. Senator, please stand up. We owe you a debt of gratitude for your many years of service to us. So, um, Mike is my neighbor and caught me out watering one day and said, hey, we're going to have a debate and we want you to come. Why do you want me to come? Well, to hear the debate and to make sure everybody behaves. I didn't know I had a caller or anything like that, but I guess because I'm the chairman of the selectman board, people think that I have a certain amount of decorum. So here's my decorum thought. These are all fine people here. Oh, where's Dennis? Dennis Hogan, good grief. Please stand up. Dennis, I didn't see you there. My apologies. Our uh, esteemed district attorney. Thank you, sir. Um, because this is New Hampshire and because the people rule here, I'm just going to ask that we maintain a certain amount of decorum and ad hominem stuff is not acceptable, not appropriate. If you disagree, disagree, but let's disagree in an amicable way. If you have a tough question, don't be afraid to ask it. These people are all gifted in the English language and they will give you an appropriate response. Having said that, I'm also the timekeeper, so this is for you guys. If I hold up the card, I'm serious, and you got 30 seconds left. So thank you very much for participating. I want to introduce, well, you've met Skip and you know Mike, so I'm going to introduce two of our questioners here, Steve Bucci, a fixture in our town for many years, along with his lovely wife, Debbie. You've been on school boards, budget committees, all kinds of stuff. Steve, we're looking forward to some good questions. And Raoul Blanchet, who's now also on the Cooperative Budget Committee, um, which is no easy job, I might add. But thank you both for your service to our community. With that, I'm going to turn over to Whoever's going to moderate, I guess you're going to have some opening statements here. Skip, is that how you want to proceed? Sure. All right, thanks. I'll take my seat and hold up signs when you need to. Once again, thank you very much for coming out on this very warm summer, still, summer day, uh, summer night. Again, my name is Skip Murphy. I'm the co founder of GreenwichRock.com. We are the the leading and most influential political blog site here in New Hampshire. Most of you know of us. If not, we have some bookmarks out in the other room. Feel free to take them with you. We opine from a uh, right of center uh, standpoint. We call ourselves conservatarians, conservative with a small L libertarian meanings. But we also do citizen journalism, where we basically just roll the tape, roll the cameras put them up on Granite Rock, and you folks get to decide for yourselves. This is one of those events. I have been asked as moderator to kind of keep things moving along, and I will try to do that, even though I am the one on Granite Rock who is never known to be able to write short. So this will be interesting. The order of events, we've already had you seated, Pledge of Allegiance, and the wonderful song. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start off with uh, opening statements, of which we have already had from, uh, oh gosh, I'm so terrible at names. Mark, thank you. Um, our candidates will have uh, opening uh, statements for about 90 seconds. We're going to have a lightning round where I will read a question, and the questions will either be yes, no, or multiple choice, and we're just going to go as quickly as we can. After that, these fine two gentlemen have their own questions to ask of you. They will be more thought provoking. You will have the chance to be able to talk through your answers. If we have time, we are going to try to keep this going as quickly as possible. Uh, we will accept questions from the audience. We're all set to go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you have about 90 seconds. Timer, are you ready? I'm ready, sir. All right, so let's start at the closest end. 90 seconds, tell us who you are and why you are here. Well, before I introduce myself, I just want to thank you, Rob. I want to thank the client group. And I want to thank my wife, Amy, who never signed. 
signed up for this. She supports me anyway. It's an honor to sit here with these incumbents. They have been working for this town for decades. This debate is not about character. It's not about integrity. It's about policy. I want to make sure that everyone here understands that. Okay. What I want to say is that this debate is not about integrity and it's not about um, character. It's about policy and direction of this town. We have introduced each other. The Lanter has been here for 10 years with a stellar attendance record in Congress. Carolyn has done it for almost 20 years. It's my job tonight to give you a reason to vote for someone else. That is what I intend to do. And I'm done. Who's Jim Belanger? I'm a Navy veteran and I moved here to Hollis in 1971 with four children who could barely speak English. We bought a house on Proctor Hill Road. We were moving in, and you can imagine, a young family, 28 years old, just moving into a house and the fire trucks went by. And I left and followed the fire trucks and helped fight a fire. And I've been helping the town ever since. If you add up the years of service I've given to this town, on the planning board, zoning board, police department, fire department, you name it, I have 270 years. I'm not going to Concord to change things. I'm going to Concord to hopefully stop changes that harm us. And that's what Jim Belanger is. If you choose to send me back, I'll very happily go. And I believe in term limits, so this is probably my last term. Hello, everyone. Get, get closer, don't okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Donald Lavasser. Many of you here know me. I want to introduce myself to those who don't. I grew up in Massachusetts, 17 miles west of Boston. I have two degrees, one in medical technology and one in economics. I did my med tech clinical rotation at the VA hospital in West Roxbury. Upon graduation, I worked in various private and public settings. After obtaining my degree in economics, I took a sales and marketing position with the manufacturer. 
manufacture of critical care diagnostic analyzers. It was during this time I met my wonderful husband, Dan. We moved to Hollis in 1998. During that time, I started working in sales and marketing for a high-tech company here in New Hampshire. In 2003, our son Christopher was born. Dan and I came here for the lovely rural character of Hollis to settle down and raise a family. I've heard a quote used by several congressional candidates on the trail this summer attributed to Chris Sununu. He said, if you were born in New Hampshire, you were lucky. If you moved to New Hampshire, you were smart. Well, Dan and I were pretty smart to move to Hollis. We absolutely love living here and can't imagine living anywhere else. Hollis has a strong spirit of community service. It is in that spirit I have decided to run for public office. I've had the pleasure of being endorsed by both Hollis Selectman Chair Mark Ledoux and Hollis Selectman Frank Cadwell. In addition, yesterday, I was blessed to receive another endorsement. This time it was from Cornerstone Action. Cornerstone is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization whose mission is to strengthen families and promote a more vibrant government of, by, and for the people in the state of New Hampshire. I'm honored to have received this endorsement. I look forward to this evening's debate. Thank you. Candidates, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go to the lightning round. I will ask a question, and again, it will either be a yes or no answer, or it will be a multiple choice answer. So we'll just start this end with Dr. Kelly. Infrastructure. We're always hearing about falling down or, or red letter bridges. There's also budget priorities, like spending $200,000 on wildfire flowers. I always thought that they just blew my house because they're wild. We always hear about them from politicians, but they always seem to be around. Are you willing to cut these lower priority items from the budget completely to be able to fund those of higher importance rather than always saying we just need more money? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, we're going to need to pass the mic along so that people can hear. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what it was you said that we can't was. Hear you. Yes. Yes. Multiple choice. <laughs> that was one of the three answers, right? Yes, no, or multiple <laughs> choice. I, I do not pledge to cut anything or pass anything until I hear the arguments for and on. So I can't answer yes or no as a, as a flat thing unless I know what the subject is. Yes. Okay, next. Uh, Article 28A is a Guilford Budget Committee member, this is my favorite article in the New Hampshire Constitution. 
The state shall not mandate or assign any new expanded or modified programs or responsibilities to any political subdivision, which is one of which would be Hollis, in such a way as to necessitate additional local expenditure by the political subdivision, and it keeps going on from there. Have you ever used this in the past, if you are a local official here in Hollis, in that position to be able to do so? Or will you use it to protect Hollis and other communities here in New Hampshire if you see such legislation coming to the floor? Whoever has the microphone. I don't understand the question. I'm not an incumbent. Okay. Article 28 says the state cannot pass a bill that forces local towns to spend money if the state also doesn't give money to the town to pay for it i.e. special education, if you don't, if they say you will spend it all, but give you no money under Article 28A in the New Hampshire Constitution, you, by constitutional right, don't have to spend the money. If hardly anybody in the state of New Hampshire takes advantage of this. My question is, would you? Are you talking about an unfunded mandate? I am. Can you repeat the question one more time, please? Article 28 basically says that if the state sends down to the towns a mandate telling you to spend money but doesn't give you the money to fulfill it, you're, you don't have to do that mandate. Very few people, very few towns ever take advantage of that. Would you, if in the legislature, see such legislation saying that, would you vote no, would you argue against it, or would you just vote for it? I'm against unfunded mandates being passed down to a community to pay for, so. Okay. Communities should not have to be burdened by the state with an unfunded mandate. Okay, I'll remind you folks, we need to go to a yes, no real quick. These aren't supposed to be quick these, answers. These are not yes, no questions, I'm sorry. I agree. 28A, we can't pass something that's not funded by the state. I'm of the belief that unfunded mandates is the equivalent of tyranny. Okay, thank you. Medicaid expansion, GOP platform says, we believe that happiness and success are the result of individual effort, hard work, dedication to a purpose. We believe that economies flourish when all people retain as much of their hard earned income as possible to spend and invest as they see fit. Morally, is it fair to hardworking citizens supporting their own families to be forced to pay for single, childless, able bodies, people's health care? Yes or no? Yes. Under circumstances where we have a safety net, the current program is untenable. Medicaid expansion has brought funds in here into the state to help, and especially with the opioid crisis. I'm, I'm going to remind you, yes or no, please. I'm with Dr. Kelly. If a person is able-bodied and able to work, they should not be on Medicare, Medicaid. Thank you. Next, there is a rumor that red flag laws are coming up. This has been a national issue in that those that, there are people who believe that others may bring harm to themselves or to others, and their guns can be taken away from them for some period of time. Article 2A in the New Hampshire Constitution, all persons have the right to keep and bear arms in defense of themselves, their families, their property, and the state. Article 18, the right of the accused, Every subject shall have a right to produce all proofs that may be favorable to himself, to meet the witnesses against him face to face, and to be fully heard in defense by himself and counsel. I won't read the rest of it. Red flag laws, should they be allowed, even though that the person that is having their property taken away from them is not allowed or is sometimes not even told that this action is about to happen? Would you be in favor? Yes. No or? red flag laws. No red flag laws. <coughs> no, I thought I knew what a yes/no question was. <laughs> uh, 
I, I support the right to bear arms and I support the right to keep your arms, whether you're charged or not, but I don't think everybody should have them. Um, I think it needs study as to domestic violence is a huge issue. The Second Amendment last line says, shall not be infringed, period. It doesn't say shall not be infringed if you have medical or other disabilities. It says shall not be infringed. I'm against red flag laws. Next, we have to religious freedom and the right of conscience, legally protected by the New Hampshire Constitution. We have seen the case of masterpiece cakes go to the Supreme Court where a baker refused to bake a cake for a lesbian, uh, for a gay couple, because of religious background. The question is, should they bake the cake, or should they be allowed not to because of religious beliefs? Freedom of expression is the First Amendment. They should not be required to do anything that they do not feel compelled to do. This may be a losing battle, but I am going to ask for a yes or no, please. It's been decided by the Supreme Court. Well, we're, we're looking for your opinion, please. Don't bake the cake. Yes. 
last question. Would you tell constituents if they want a bill to come before the state legislation, le legis legislation, excuse me, that you know is just something that's just way out there, should you be able to tell them, or will you tell them, this doesn't pass muster, I don't think this should go for you? Yes, absolutely. Some people just want to be listened to, so, but they need to know what is appropriate to bring forth this legislation and what isn't. I can't answer that yes or no because I've had that happen to me where I did not believe in a bill, but a constituent asked me to introduce it, and I did. I feel it's my obligation to do that. I do not have to support it, however. I have a situation where I'm looking for someone to sponsor a bill that has been requested of me because I think someone else has the issue more than I do. I believe in transparency and accountability. If someone wishes to have a bill laid forward, I can talk to them, decide whether it's a good idea. If they insist upon it, then it's my obligation. Thank you, candidates. I do appreciate that. At this point, I'm going to turn the questioning over to the panel. Testing. Testing. I'll, I'll put my Italian voice in gear and I'll be very loud. How's that? Okay. Um, thank you again. So we're going to get into a little bit more in depth on a couple of particular topics. I'm going to provide a little more context to a couple of my questions. We'll rotate between Raul and I. His are going to be pretty, uh, pretty uh, succinct, uh, succinct and, and quick. So you'll see a difference of perspective as you get questions from each of us. I think based on what happened here in the last lightning round, we'll start with Carolyn for the first question, then Jim you'll answer, then Donna, then Jim, and then we'll rotate to the next person as we get to the next question. Okay, first one, um, New, New Ham this is related to the New Hampshire retirement system and healthcare benefits. Okay, at the local level, annual town and school budget increases and corresponding resultant property tax increases are consistently driven by increasing retirement pension and healthcare obligations for public employees. For comparisons between public and private sectors, Many people believe that these public benefits are very lucrative and dramatically exceed what many in the private sector and the taxpayers paying the bills do not have for themselves or their families. For years at the local level, boards tend to push this off to the states, something for the state to address. Obviously your position, if you get elected, you'll be addressing this. So for the retirement system, New Hampshire has an unfunded liability of over $5 billion. The state still assumes seven and a quarter percent guaranteed return rates when they determine the responsibilities that push down to all of us. All of this directly plays into our property taxes that from the numbers are averaging about 4.8% increase per year over the last 15 years. Here's the question, starting with Carolyn. Do you agree with the current pension system if so, why? If not, what have you done over the past number of years to address it, or what will you do specifically going forward if you're elected again as our next representative? There have been changes in the uh, retirement system, um, not affecting those, the new, it affects the new people coming on, and it's more like the private sector. And I know several years ago, the state quit sending as much money to the towns as they had been in the past. And I know that's an issue that I believe the state has an obligation, but the state has been trying to, uh, I know that the, the deficit is big and it's not unusual in other states as well, but that is a big issue that we need to address. 
answered everything, but. So I'm gonna come back to the specific question. Do you agree with the current pension system? If you do, why? If not, what have you done specifically to address it or what will you do going forward? I agree with the changes that have been made. I agree with the fact that you can't, um, it, well you could, but I don't think it's the right thing to do to change the system for people who've already been in it. But I definitely agree that there needs to be changes and I would support those changes. I think the current retirement system is out of control. When somebody can retire and earn more money than they were earning when they were working, something's wrong. Uh, so I, I agree that there's a problem. Uh, I know that there's been attempts to change this and to make it better, but they haven't been successful. I'm one of 400 representatives, and I have one voice. I have talked to folks on the Finance Committee who are more influential than I am in these matters and tried to get some changes made, but my pleas have fallen on deaf ears, but I'll continue to try to get changes made. I believe it definitely needs to be a change and it needs to happen now. Five billion of unfunded liability is just not acceptable. I read an article that in 200, uh, excuse me, 2014, $900 million was taken out of the fund to pay for cost of living increases. That $900 million should have been left in the fund to accrue uh, more money to be part of compounding and, 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 and compounding power to increase the fund. Uh, public employees need to self-direct part of their wages into a 401k or maybe a directed direct cash savings account. Um, the folks that have uh, served us um, who are near retirement, uh, you know, the plan should stay the same for them, but uh, new hires and, and um, people that are entering the system uh, are really going to need to, to self-direct their wages and they're going to need to start self-directing their wages towards health care too. People who retire, collect retirement and work in a retirement position should continue to pay into the retirement system. That's what I've been pushing. I disagree with the current pension system. The United States Army, as monolithic as it is, has been able to change from a pension system after 20 years to a 401k system. I see no reason why the state of New Hampshire can't mimic that model. People are grandfathered in after a certain number of years of service. Those who have not achieved those numbers of years of service are put into a 401k system. People who are in between can make a decision which way they want to go. It's not all that difficult. The doc if the Department of Defense can do this, the state of New Hampshire can do this. Okay, thank you very much. The next part of this question, related to the context that I provided, was the healthcare aspect. Remember again, at the local town and school levels, we still pay as, you know, as a part of our property taxes, we still pay greater than 90% to even 100% of health care benefit plans for various public employees and with current annual deductibles at the $500 to 1000 level. Contrast that to the private sector where most employers are paying maybe 70% or less and with the employee and annual deductibles now exceeding $5,000 a year. Of course, all of this plays into funding uh, you know, the budgets at the local level and our increased property taxes. Now, the question, do you agree with the current health care plans and payment structures? If so, why? If not, what have you done over the past number of years? Or what will you specifically do going forward? Jim Belanger first, thank you. Well, I may be mistaken, but it seems to me that the subject matter you're talking about is a local issue voted on at town meeting, and uh, it's not a state issue. Uh, 
because we don't set the, the participation or the, um, the amount that a town pays towards a health plan. So what have you done about it? I just think public employees should be paying towards their health care costs. Um, we had a situation earlier in the year when the co-op school budget committee uh, didn't really receive um, the uh, contract from the administrators as far as the teachers' wages and their health care benefits. Um, in a timely manner. They had been waiting since the fall and it didn't get to them until January or February, very, very, very close to the co-op meeting. Um, and that's just not right. Um, I think that we need to have strength when we uh, negotiate these contracts and I think we need to negotiate from a position of strength uh, with the union uh, leadership. Um, one thing as that could pertain to the school contracts is that we become an SB2 town. Um, that way, uh, there's a deadline that the contract has to be given to the budget committee for review. And um, if we had been an SB2 town, uh, the budget committee would have had that contract earlier. This is a public thing. You shouldn't be so worried. SB2. <laughs> this is an issue that's dear to my heart as a physician. You have too many people and organizations leeching off the healthcare system. Insurance CEOs, hospital CEOs, pharmacy CEOs. How would you feel if we could take the same budget, the Medicaid budget that our representatives voted to expand, it's a $2 billion budget, take one quarter of it, provide salaries for the 2,500 primary care physicians in this state. In return, they get tort reform, and they see 4,000 patients per year for free. It solves Medicaid. It solves Medicare. It solves VA issues. It solves all the insurance for primary care. That's how you reduce insurance costs. You take them out of the picture. And we can do that. We can do that. The health insurance, of course, is one of our big issues in this country and in this state. And I believe that um, there needs to be more contribution from, you said from the town employees, is that what you said? Yes, okay, I'm just, that's what I'm saying. issues, I think the top issue in 
in my mind, it all is just the property tax uh, that is so high, and it's high because we need to fund the things that we pass at town meeting. Why is it important? It's important because it limits uh, the, I hate to say quality, but it, the, the financial ability of residents who can move into town. And I've been here long enough to know that somebody new moves in from New Jersey, for example, and says, in New Jersey we did this, how come you don't do it here? And then all of a sudden we're starting to do it. And it's not the same. It, we're increasing the town's obligations every year. That's why the property tax issue is important and perhaps uh, a cap might be something we could explore. And you had a third part to the question and I don't, I didn't write what, it down. What, what, are the, what are the top three issues yeah. that you think being at the state as a state representative? Well, the top three are property tax, property tax, property tax. Okay. So why is it that important? I guess if, if, I, I, if your answer is a one part of the question, I guess it's obvious. And then the, the third part of that question is, well, what is it going to be the primary issue you're going to address in your first day of the job? Well, the, the primary issue I'm going to address is, is I've been conquered. I'm on the Municipal and County Government Committee. So I deal with an awful lot of issues that affect towns, obviously, because that's the name of the committee. And I'm there to try to protect unfunded mandates and to make sure that we don't pass uh, laws that maybe it's not an unfunded mandate, but it requires more uh, effort on the part of the community to do things. For example, uh, patrolling uh, ATVs. Uh, those things have come up before our community before, and if we, if, you know, if we need to change that, the fishing game doesn't have to do it anymore, but the police department does. It's not an unfunded mandate, but it certainly is a mandate that's going to cost us more money. So I'm ever vigilant as to what is required of townspeople and why. And uh, so I watch this. Eight to nine hundred bills that come to, before us in Concord every year. Uh, you can't be familiar with every single one of them. Uh, I'm familiar with the ones that come before the Municipal and County Government Committee. I'm not familiar with the Children and Family Law or the Finance Committee and so on. And I can't be expert at all of them, but I'll just do my best to make sure that we don't increase the burden on the community. I'm gonna narrow this down to a top two issue because I think the two issues are intertwined and they are increasing property taxes and quality of education in the town of Hollis. And I don't think that this is, a, um, is unique to Hollis. I think this is uh, um, a balancing act that happens all over the state. But um, our property taxes, um, the majority of our property taxes are used to school the funds to, uh, excuse me, used to fund the schools, the co-op, and then the uh, schools in Hollis. Um, and it's very intertwined. So I think it goes back to trying to decrease or keep, hold steady the school budgets. Um, we were told at the co-op level uh, the budget would never increase over $19 million, and now it's $21 million and climbing for an enrollment that's dropping. Um, so we really uh, need to attend the meetings and understand what's going on up there. Um, the voters want value for their property taxes. Um, going to the schools, they want the schools to be providing a um, great education in all the basics a high quality of education, and uh, that's what's expected in return for the property taxes. Um, so I think a, a lot of vigilance and a lot of um, pushback uh, needs to be put on the school board to, to keep the costs um, in check. I'll take it. Well, I'm looking at um, state issues, and one of them is 
and it affects the town is the opioid crisis. And I think a lot needs to be done, starting with prevention. And we need, we also need um, uh, other issue, other, that just lost my train of thought. I can't think of a word. Anyway, the opioid crisis, and it's something that I have been involved with as far as substance abuse in this town since the 80s. Another one is education. That's state and local. And what's, what now is happening with the town is that we're keeping our statewide property tax funds and not sending them to Concord. But there are poor, poor communities who can't even raise enough. So um, I think unless it's something that's done to make a more uniform funding, we're going to be facing another lawsuit. But the property tax issue is something this state has chosen to use for funding instead of having a state uh, statewide income or sales tax. So I think in, in what I've seen some uh, numbers that say that even with our high property taxes, that we are like number seven in total tax burden in the country. So, um, and, from the bottom or seven? I'm sorry, what? Seven from the bottom or seven from the top? Um, seven from the Anyway, we're, we're pretty good. Seven is good, a good number. <laughs> and um, what would I do in, in um, what would I do about on my first day? I would um, I'm on criminal justice and public safety now, and the first thing that we do is look at the bills, thousand bills or less, and um, we the work gets done in the committee, and that's where it's very important to be participating because that's what goes to the full house, and that's what usually gets passed or accepted that recommendation. So, work in the committee is where I would be starting. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think my obligation to this community starts when I end up in Concord. My obligation to this community starts now. I'm running for an office. We need transparency and accountability. We have spoken before about pension and health care. I'm already gathering the brain trust here in Hollis. We have a unique district. We have engineers, we have teachers, we have doctors, we have PAs, we have a plethora of knowledge in this community. It's my obligation as a representative to represent you, to find out what are the good ideas out there. I'm not going to vote on a northern pass unless I've spoken to your engineers. People who may not have dogs in the fight, but know more about it than I do. This is an obligation of a representative. Accountability and transparency. I think the pension system is one of those things that has to be fixed. Towns are going to go under. We don't do it. I don't know much about a pension system. So let's get together on a Tuesday night with the selectmen of here and Mason and Nashua and Alderman and sit down and come up with an idea that will work for all the communities of the state. I am meeting on October 19th with the medical directors of St. Joe's, Southie, and, and Dartmouth Hitchcock so that we can talk about what is the best way to manage health care issues for our community. How do we do this? How do we, we reduce those costs? Get the CEOs out of the picture.
So my obligation to you, and my obligation to this community, is not when I'm in Concord, it's now. I guess we've gone into the closing remarks at this point. Um, thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, let's continue up the line, and then what I would like to do is open it up for any audience questions. Uh, we have some amount of time left in the schedule to be able to do that. Uh, but since you've started, we might as well go through it unless you folks have more questions. 8.30? You have more questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Okay, you nodded to me. I thought you were over. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, next question is related to the school system and the quality of education and costs. So, I, I think we, we all understand the intricacy of the local level and the state level when we talk about education. It, it involves everybody. What's interesting is we all know we live in a town with a great school system. However, we also see school budgets continuing to rise substantially, even with our student population declining. Our quality of education doesn't appear to be improving in terms of various metrics that are being tracked. If you go to School Digger, for example, you'll see the test results, school rankings, maybe going backwards. The challenges that we face are these unfunded mandates that we talk about that are flowing down. In addition, education standards, we hear about Common Core or other initiatives flowing from Washington to Concord that are driving some of these initiatives, costs, potentially poorer results. Um, whatever adds, you know, what, what adds to this locally is, you know, many people believe Whatever a school system wants, in terms of money, for example, they should be given. Well, when you look at this from a Republican standpoint, you say fortunately or unfortunately, we have a founding principle of fiscal responsibility. Now, I would say we also have a criteria for the Republicans of quality education. So the question here is, what do you believe we need to do to improve the quality of education while in parallel maintaining fiscal responsibility? That starts with Donna, I believe. The schools in Hollis are struggling to teach math right now. And I wish there was a magic wand that could be waved over the schools to make it all better and make it disappear, but there's no magic wand. We've been working uh, with Common Core as an unfunded mandate. Um, probably four or five years now that came into the school systems unbeknownst to the parents and it's just not working. Um, Common Core was designed for um, people who might only aspire to get an associate's degree. Um, it's really dumbed down and it's just not working. I think that we need to go back to the basics in the school in teaching the basics of math, English, science. I think the basics in cursive, cursive writing, um, all those things are very important. The schools are really struggling. They're not getting the information that they need from the Smarter Balance assessments from the state. Um, in the, in the uh, seventh and eighth grade, this year they want to um, also test the kids using the PSAT test, which they've never done before. And that tells me they're not getting the information um, from the Smarter Balance in order to uh, teach the subjects properly. And the public schools are, are great for some kids, but one size doesn't fit all. Um, so I'm going to just do a little sidebar because I would like to see programs for school choice in New Hampshire um, because one size doesn't fit all and some kids need a different kind of education and many children are trapped in a failing school and uh, these are children, disadvantaged families, um, at or below the poverty level. So I think that um, the state needs to do something about that, and I do believe there are some 
bills that will be coming up um, this next legislative session to address that. As far as it goes in Hollis, I think the parents really need to um, ask questions, ask pertinent questions, um, group together and demand that um, the children are, are being taught properly. chairman of the school board. Uh, can you blame him? If he can get away with it, why not? I was in town when we brought up the subject of kindergarten. and the People stood up professing for kindergarten, and I'm not against kindergarten now, don't get me wrong. It's just the system. And there were promises made, we will never ever ask for full day kindergarten. We will never ever ask for transportation for our kindergarten. Well, guess what? We got a federal grant to put sidewalks in town. We will never ever have to worry about it because the federal money's gonna pay for it. It won't cost us a dime. I wish you could tell that to Hollis Construction when they're out there plowing it in the winter time. Uh, yet we just don't see what we're asking for. The first time I ever ran for state rep, I was in the community room at town hall and I said, you don't like the taxes in town? It's your fault. And I pointed to them. You used to call your neighbor when his dog barked. Now you call the police department. You used to take your son when you broke a leg and bring him to the ER. Now you call an ambulance. And you have a headache, you call the second ambulance. <laughs> it's our own it's our own dilemma. The question was about local education, is that correct? <laughs> well, I, I'm trying to remember the question. What do you believe we need to do to improve the quality of education while in parallel maintaining fiscal responsibility? I wanted to gather information for tonight, so I did talk to the chairman of the education committee. And you talked about, or somebody talked about standards, the Board of Education sets standards, and that is an appointed group by the governor and council, and it's a small group. But they set the standards. Now, the curriculum can be determined by the local schools, school board, as long as it, if, meets the standards and it can change to exceed the standards. So that is the way that works, but the curriculum is really under local control. And the way that students are taught is a local decision. And then the assessments, the tests, they're state and federal, which I believe it's third, eighth, and 11th grade, somebody from any, anyway, that's the way it's working now, and it's my understanding from the chairman that the Commissioner of Education is doing an excellent job at looking at what's going on with the, the Board of Education, I mean, not the Board, but the Department of Education and making some significant, really good changes. So, 
That's what I can share with you right now. Again, I'm going to come back to transparency and accountability. It's clear that Common Core is not working. It is clear that Common Core, as any standardized system, has a regression towards the mean. It may help those on the lower end, but it hurts everybody on the upper end. Teachers get evaluated based upon the success of their students in Common Core. Why not let them teach the way they, were, they know how to teach? Why not give them the opportunity to be able to get the best out of our students instead of teaching to, our, to an exam? So I am against the concept of Common Core. I also believe the hand of Adam Smith works. If any of you don't know that, it's the Wealth of Nations, a man in the 1700s wrote about competition. Now, competition improves everything. We have a school system in our country which is a monopoly. Why not introduce competition? Why not introduce the concept of alternative schools? For as Donna said, for those students that may not be able to succeed under a standard curriculum. Why not do that? If your system isn't working, there's no good reason why you should not be able to, as a parent, find a system that works for your children. And then that improves the current school system. So competition, removal of common core, transparency and accountability as a legislator, I should be sitting down with the teachers in this community and saying, what can I do as a legislator to make your job easier? What can I do as a legislator? Wave the magic wand. I don't know what that is. I don't teach. I'm not in those, in those classrooms. But I need to get that information. And when a bill is coming up affecting legislation, it is my responsibility to be in touch with you and say, Here's this bill coming in in March. Here's the text. Please read it. Tell me what you think. That's my responsibility. I shouldn't be waiting for you to come to me to agree or disagree with a bill that you've heard about by reading in the National Telegram. It is my obligation to give you the information and then for you to tell me what is best for you as a teacher, as a parent, and as a student. Can I just mention that there are the charter schools that no town would establish a charter school so finally the state decided to start creating charter schools. That is one alternate and also in my discussion with the chair of the committee, um, there there should be a better system of reciproc reciproc reciprocation um, between schools, where one school has one strength and another school has another strength. And uh, I could uh, certainly support that.
heard, I was uh, deployed to Afghanistan. What do they do in Afghanistan to vote? They put ink on their thumb, they put it on a piece of paper, and they match that fingerprint. Gee, what a concept. No technology. And they're able to identify the voters. We don't need identification cards. We don't need any of this people who complain that they can't get an identification card. We can use biometrics. It's not all that difficult. You just have to have a political will to make that happen. Electricity. During the campaign, I got an education. We do need to reduce our costs. I thought, well, you know, Northern Pass would be a great idea. Just put it underground. But I was speaking with an electrical engineer. And he made it clear that that is simply not an option for a variety of different reasons. What I learned from that, my takeaway, I don't have those answers. But there are people in this community who do. All they need to do is be asked. All they need to do is January 3rd, we can meet and say, get all the electrical engineers in this town, sit them down and say, well, how would you fix that problem? Is it nuclear? Is it tidal? Is it wind power? Or is it decentralization? I don't have an answer that needs to be addressed. And we have the brain power in this town to be able to address it. All they need to do is be asked. School security. There's a couple of issues here. One is, how do we prevent the tragedies that are occurring? I believe that to be a mental health issue. I believe that's something that the medical community has failed to address. And certainly the insurance community has failed to address it. And I think that's where it needs to be addressed. Second issue, someone gets into the school, what do we do? I don't think we need to arm our teachers, but I do think our teachers should be allowed to be armed. Third issue. What do we do with the, with the, with the, the uh, casualties? Do our students, do our teachers know how to take care of a bleeding student instead of walking over him? We have failed to teach them this. This is as fundamental this day and age as CPR was when I was there. the question about voter registration. From my perspective, the only thing to answer one other question. Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, but I'm thinking time-wise. You know, the way I feel about voting and voter registration is that it's not only a responsibility and a privilege for us. And I, I guess maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think it's important that you bring to your to the polls your citizenship, proof, proof of citizenship, and proof of where you live. And I just think it's it's such an important duty that we have to vote, but I know there are such things as signing affidavits, and I do believe that there needs to be a better follow-up on those affidavits and making sure that those people are who they say they are and where they live, and that's, I believe it's what Secretary stated, it may be in the Attorney General's responsibility now. I really think people need to prove who they are and that they are eligible to vote. 
I'm going to be quick. Voter registration, I think uh, there is a need to identify people who come to vote, and they should be res residents of the state and residents of the community in which they're voting. Uh, I can't imagine a selectman getting elected in uh, uh, Dover because there's 500 students that came to vote that day that live in Arkansas. Uh, they have absentee ballots in Arkansas. Uh, cost of electricity is too high. How do we solve it? I'm not sure. Northern Pass has been bandied around back and forth. Next time you drive down the highway, look up as you're driving, but be careful at the telephone poles and the power lines and the transformers at each house and see how ugly they are, but you don't notice them anymore. And secure schools, there was a good uh, plan presented uh, to a school board uh, earlier this year, or maybe it was the end of last year, about providing an office in the school for police officers to show up with their cruisers Park the cruiser, go into that office, fill out their paperwork instead of doing it at the police station. So there would be a police officer presence at the school and there would be a cruiser sitting out there and are you gonna go in and try to shoot them up with one or two cruisers sitting outside the door? Uh, and it wouldn't have cost us a dime. Uh, as far as voter integrity issues in the state, We've tightened up some of our laws to clarify the difference between domicile versus residence. And I just want to ditto what Jim Belanger said about the students. Um, if the students want to vote um, and they're from out of state, they should be getting an absentee ballot and voting um, with their home state. Electricity, I cringe every time I pay my electric bill here, every time. Um, and electricity in New Hampshire is a complicated issue. The high cost of electricity is a deterrent to bringing business into the state. Um, it's absolutely something that needs to be addressed and it is being addressed. Um, there is a huge booklet about it Right now, we get our electricity from a market basket of products, um, from nuclear, a little bit from coal, natural gas, biomass. Um, the governor has decided not to subsidize biomass. Um, I don't know what his plan is to replace the output that the biomass uh, produces, but he felt that the majority of the biomass plants uh, we're in the red all the time, and the state of New Hampshire's already given them approximately $2 billion, um, and he just doesn't want to subsidize them anymore. I have a feeling that's because of the cheap um, cost of fracked natural gas, and I think that they need to have a solution to deliver the gas um, to be used for the residents of New Hampshire, not just to be passed through the state for the benefit of other residents of New England. So it's a complicated issue. Um, the Senate is working on trying to veto the governor's, um, to override, excuse me, override the governor's veto on the energy bill. So it's gonna be a lot of back and forth, give and take. Um, I don't have a direct answer, but um, I know that they are working on it. And as far as the school, better securing the schools, I know a while ago the Department of Homeland Security came and helped them out, did an audit. Um, I think that it's a complicated issue. I agree it's a mental health issue. I think some of these uh, child shooters fall through the cracks. Um, the child in Florida, at Parkland, absolutely fell through the cracks. He was supposed to uh, he had requested to go to a different school, a different program, and Broward County denied his request. So um, he fell through the cracks and the system failed him. But we really want to stop an event before it happens. Um, that's, that's the best scenario. Um, and that includes bullying, too. Um, that includes bullying. And we I feel that a school is a target-rich area. Unfortunately, it's a target-rich area um, for a shooter. And I, 
my preference would be to have an armed resource officer in the school at all times. And as far as Jim Kelly um, idea, I do believe that teachers uh, shouldn't be forced to, to be armed, but if there are some that would choose to be armed, I think that would be of great benefit. Everybody answered three questions, and I only answered one. Well, I'll be very brief. But school security, I understand there are funds have gone out to school districts to work on school safety, school security, and and we'll be voting next Thursday on those energy bills. And as I've heard from most everybody, please override the governor's veto. Candidates, I want to say thank you very much for enduring all of these questions. I do appreciate it. Um, we do have audience uh, time for audience questions. I do have one right here that I will read to you. Often it is said that there is no tax on earned income here in New Hampshire, but there is a tax. It's called the dividend income tax. For those that are retired, that is their net income forever. That is an income tax. How would you vote if, if it, would you vote yes or no to get rid of the dividends tax? I know who that question came from. Um, and it is an income tax. And it's the hidden income tax. And there were proposals to either reduce or get rid of it. My problem is we just have certain sources of revenue and if we get rid of, rid of one source, I could, I could vote probably to reduce or maybe get rid of it if there was another way that we could have revenue. But I'm not talking income or sales, no, I'm not. It is an income tax, and it's a slippery slope. And I'm committed to not having an income tax in our state. We have another similar type tax. The Family Leave Act is essentially a payroll tax. When this bill was passed, it was also on the bill by the insurance department indicated that the private sector had the same insurance that could be used on a voluntary basis. But instead, our state our representatives decided this is a mandatory tax on every worker, unless you can find notary during working hours and withdraw from it. So, do I think we should not have the dividends tax? Yes, because it affects the elderly. Do I think we should eliminate the, the uh, payroll tax of the uh, Family Leave Act? Yes, I do. That's available uh, in the private sector. It does not have to be mandatory to uh, employment. The paid Family Leave Act is Yes, I would vote to repeal the interest and dividends tax as soon as somebody tells me how they're going to make up the difference uh, between what that provides and what it doesn't. But we do have income tax in New Hampshire. You sell your house and you go to Registry of Deeds and you, you pay a transfer tax based on what? On what you sold it on. And not on what you paid for it when you bought it, which is what it should be. So we do have more income tax and sales taxes and you can shake a stick at it. Go register your car and see that 10 years of, of sales tax you're paying. I too would like to see that tax eliminated, but I would have to see, um, because I'm not an incumbent, I'd want to know exactly how much revenue that's bringing into the state. Um, it is something that really uh, hurts um, people on a fixed income. Um, but I would really want to know um, where it's going, if it's going to areas that don't need it, 
uh, other areas of the budget that don't need it, then we could eliminate it, but I want to know where it's going first, and we could take steps to address this. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, come on up. just an easy th thing that you can do on a whim. Mrs. Gargas, because of time, I'm going to have to ask you to, to stop. So we, do have, we do have a follow-up follow question. Well, do you support a parent's right to withhold permission for gender reassignment amputations? Sure. Um, even if that, because in other states we know that children custody is being taken of children whose parents withhold that and they're being taken into state custody. Do you I, oppose that? 
oppose that, yes. Right. And what about supporting the conscience rights of taxpayers who don't want to pay through Medicaid for these sur surgeries and procedures? I guess I really don't know what's involved in that. Thank you, because currently Medicaid is now paying for that. It wasn't stopped in the last legislature. But thank you, Carolyn, for taking the question. Yes, sir. Come on up. Yes, sir. Rather than me jumping over everybody, can you all hear me from here? Yes, sir. Right, loud enough? Okay. So, um, Boston is on fire. I mean, the, the property values are rising rapidly. The seacoast is, is uh, a very, very desirable place to live. But yet, our section of New Hampshire has been kind of quiet in that regard. Um, there's a lot of businesses moving to the seacoast, a lot of businesses in the Boston metropolitan area. One of the issues that I, one of the issues that the Seacoast has, and one of the things they have is, is railroad service into Boston, eight trains a day to get into the, into the Boston metropolitan area. I know this has been brought up many times about Southern New Hampshire. I would like to know how each of you feel about passenger trains in Nashua and why. 
Currently, there are about 65,000 New Hampshireites who leave the state every day to go to work. That puts a burden on our roads, that puts a burden on our infrastructure, that puts a burden on their families, and they have to leave two hours early and get home two hours late. How about changing the metro? How about making the business, business climate so good in New Hampshire that we don't need rail to Boston? That people can stay here and work. They can be within 40 minutes of their work. Change the parameter. If that's, if that's what I think. Change the parameter. Make the business tax go down. Bring businesses that are in Massachusetts here. That's the way to fix any kind of commuter issues. You know, there's what you would like to have and what you need to have. And I would kind of like to have a train to go down to Boston. But I also see that it's not going to solve our problems with transportation. I know there are businesses in Manchester who very much support, and in Nashua, support a train coming up here. So I'm, I'm mixed on that, um, and I'm not sure we need it, but um, like I said, it would be nice to have, but I think that the bus system, the commuter system with the buses has done a very good job. And we do want to get more of those cars off the road. But um, that's, that's where I am on it. As you know, I'm not the normal person that answers questions. So I'm going to answer your question a little differently. It's such a stupid idea to have commuter trains going to Boston it's going to cost us between three and five million dollars to subsidize that. We would much rather spend 35 million to make 93 have an extra lane. Of course, I support commuter train, and I will continue to do so. Jim Kelly, you stole my answer. <laughs> I think that it's better to make New Hampshire an attractive place for businesses to come so we have job creation and residents don't have to commute uh, south into Massachusetts. Um, and energy policy is something that's being looked at, um, but also um, if we became a right to work state, uh, that might help too. So. There's things that the state can do, and um, there's things that the legislators can do, but as far as a train, I don't think it's necessary. Um, if you want to go to Boston, you can rent an Uber. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the back. What was barely touched on was the opioid crisis we have in New Hampshire. It was mentioned. Barely. And it's a big deal, I think. And what troubles me is that a lot of now in this state is being spent on perpetuating addiction. If somebody overdoses, we just keep Narcanning them and they keep pulling right back to it, their, their addictive ways. And if we treat them, we treat them with methadone, which then just makes them addicted to methadone, and then they get perpetuated on methadone with no end in sight. Now, my brother-in-law is addicted to methadone. And New Hampshire couldn't do anything for him, except keep him on methadone. Well, this guy who had his master's degree in, electri in electrical engineering, owned a home and ran marathons, is now homeless, jobless, and has no teeth. Is there a way that we could, instead of spending money on perpetuating addiction or funding statistics, that we could actually maybe see some, some cures and some treatments that will actually get people off of their addictions so that they can have a real future instead of just this perpetual game. I'm going to sidestep the, the treatment things and leave that to people that are better understanding of the, of the situation. Uh, I agree with you there's a problem. Three years ago I introduced a bill into the legislature to put habitual drug dealers that's a person who's been convicted of dealing drugs three times on a drug dealer uh, 
list, just like a sex offender list, so that if they moved from one town to another, they would have to register and let the police department there know that they are there. Now, the sex offender list is public knowledge. You can get online and find that. My uh, drug dealer list would not be public information because it would be a dictionary or a directory as to where to go buy your drugs. But it would be accessible only to law enforcement. I thought it was a good idea. I never found anybody who didn't think it was a good idea, but the legislature didn't pass it because it would be too expensive. The state of New Hampshire has already spent $150 million on treatment on, um, for opioid abuse. And it's, the solution is, is, is multiple, it's sort of a, a we, there's a federal component and a state component. Um, on the federal side, the borders need to be closed so that we don't have um, the illegal fentanyl uh, coming north into our state, uh, the synthetic fentanyl. Um, there was just a situation where um, they're all coming in from Lawrence. There was a um, Dominican national, 28-year-old female, um, caught in Nashua a week or two ago selling fentanyl. Um, this person uh, was not a um, legal citizen of the United States. This person had false papers, false identity. Um, this person is eventually going to be deported back to the country where uh, she came from. So, so um, ICE has already confiscated enough fentanyl um, to kill every man, woman, and child in the United States. Um, so, so we need to close the borders, we need tough enforcement on the pushers, and the, uh, sadly, for the, for, for, for the people like your relative, um, those people are gonna have a, a, a long, long recovery. It's, it's very tragic what's happened to them. Um, it's, Fentanyl is easy to be addicted, uh, to get addicted to. So the state has gotten $43 million uh, from the federal government, and that's going to be spent on treatment. Hopefully, the money will get uh, given out to um, facilities that have a success rate in treating um, opioid abuse. Okay. Uh, my point I is, though, that the treatment is methadone. It's not sobriety. They're not working towards getting them off of addictions. They're perpetuating them. Unfortunately, I think we've run out of time at this point. But, yes. Yes. Well, I'll try to be brief. Um, I've heard the news reports of the people, especially in Manchester, who have revived people over the same person over and over again. What do you do? Do you just let them die? I don't, it's tough. It's tough, but, but I know there's a lack of adequate rehabilitation, and I do believe it's a lot more than methadone that needs to happen. I come at it also from the point of what are we doing for prevention? We need to start with the demand and the prevention. And there are some there are some programs that have been tried and true, and we ju I just believe we need more of, of approaching it from that aspect. As a physician, I'm an empiricist. We have a lot of different programs out there. We have very poor research on addictive medicine as to what works. I do know that we have 54 states and jurisdictions in this country, and everybody is working on this. I do know that when we fail to cross state borders, either due to insurance issues or to uh, other social issues that as soon as an addict gets released back into the community into their same environment, they will relapse. So how do we prevent that? 
how about working with Maine and working with Vermont? And how about saying, okay, you have your facilities in Maine, how about if we send you 20 of our addicts? You can send us 20 of yours. And when they get released, they don't get released back to their home community. They get released to a new community. And they may not have the same associations. Will it work? Some of the time. Will it work all of the time? No. But we need to change what we are doing. And I totally agree with you that methadone and suboxone are just an alternate addiction. Thank you very much. At this point, it is time for closing remarks. And I would ask Dr. Kelly if you give your closing remarks. This time we'll see if we can keep it under two minutes for this. We have lost control here. Yeah, I'll definitely keep this under two minutes. Um, you know my biography. I don't need to repeat that here. I do believe that we have a brain trust in this community. I do believe that it's my job as a legislator to tap into that brain trust. I do believe that it is important that everyone in this community gets informed about legislation that is pending. And also, once legislation has passed, once I have voted on it, I believe I have an obligation to explain my reasons why. Too far, far too long, we have had politicians, locally, nationally, who are like prairie dogs. They come up, they say, vote for me, vote for me, vote for me. And you don't hear from them for two years, or four years, or six years. And then every election cycle, they come back and say, here I am. That's not the way to represent this community. The way to represent this community is to inform you of legislation that's coming up, get your advice, and then when it's done, get an after-action review. Find out, do you agree, do you not agree, how can we improve it next time around? Thank you. I, I would like to talk about how I make decisions. We have about a thousand bills. We can't know everything about everything. We rely on a committee system, and the committee does the homework, and it has, every bill has to have a public hearing and to be voted on on the floor of the House. And so how do I make a decision? I listen to constituents, and by the way, the, the transgender bill, I heard from many constituents, a overwhelming majority was in favor of the bill, and of course I heard from people who were quite opposed to it as well. And then, I rely on the other committees to do their homework so that I can find out what they are recommending and I can certainly pursue more information if I feel I need to. And then it goes to the floor of the House and we hear debate. So I try to be very careful and thoughtful on the bills that I do vote on. And I am very much in tune with what I hear from constituents. I think that's very a very important part of the job. Thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> uh, I'm not perfect, but I'm me. And I probably won't change. And if I vote 80% of the time the way you think I should, you should re-elect me. And if I miss that mark, uh, I'm not your enemy. I'm not running for a position uh, to get a title. I'm here to serve the community. And if you think my time has come, then fine. I've lost elections before, and I'm not dead yet. And if you elect one of these new people, you better keep me in there to teach them the ropes. Now, how can I prove to you that I'm dedicated to this community? I served on the Hollis Fire Department for 25 years, the Nashville Police Department for two years, the Hollis Police Department for 22 years. I was
was the Nashua District Court prosecutor for Hollis cases for four years. I was the bill commissioner of the Nashua District Court for 11 years. I've been a justice of the peace since 1973. I was a CPR instructor. I was in the Nashua Rotary Club and I was one of the founding people in the Hollis Brookline Rotary Club. I was its president in 2005 and six. I was president of the New Hampshire Electronic Technicians Association. I served as its president. I've been on the board of directors for Hillsborough County Fair, which is coming up this weekend for 42 years. I was a 4-H leader in Hollis for 18 years. I'm on the cap I was on the Capital Needs Committee for six years. I was on the Budget Committee for 12 years and was chair for three. I was a Hollis Selectman for six years and I was chair for two. I was a Hollis School Board member for six years and I was chair for two. I was on the Planning Board for six years and three years as chair. Y your watch is wrong. <laughs> two minutes they gave me, not 90 seconds. Uh, I was a Hollis Brookline Cooperative School Moderator for 15 years, the Hollis School Moderator for 9 years, the Hollis Assistant Town Moderator for 15 years, the Hollis Town Moderator since 2010. I'm on the Hollis Zoning Board. I've been on it since 2002. I was on the Suhegan Valley Transportation Collaborative providing the blue bus for rides to medical appointments, a Democrat thing. I was on the Highway Safety Committee from 2007. I'm still the chairman. I'm on the Hollis Cable TV Committee. I'm a U.S. Navy Vietnam veteran. I served 1960 to 68 on the USS Nautilus, USS Neosho, USS Biddle. Uh, I was been married to the love of my life, Sandra St. Pierre, for 55 years. Uh, I was an engineering assistant at Sanders Associates. I founded and ran Beltronics in Hollis for 40 years. And I operate some businesses in town today. I was the VFW Post Commander that founded the VFW Post in 1992. And I was its commander from 92 to 94 and 2002 to 2015. And I'm still an active member. And I was a Hollis Boy Scout Scoutmaster for two years when the troop was going to fold. But it didn't. Well, my statement's going to be short because I just realized I made duplicate copies of the first page. I entered this race because I believe the Hollis voter wants full-time conservative representation. I am prepared to deliver such representation full-time. This means someone that is able to be in Concord all the time as needed, not someone who has previous commitments, has to fly out of town for extended periods, or can only be there for a small percentage of the votes. I can do this. I have the ability to give back to our community in a full-time capacity. Conservative. Being a conservative means one ascribes to a set of beliefs that is used to guide one's actions. Legislators must use the state's constitution as their guiding star when drafting and voting on legislation. Republican lawmakers must create and vote on legislation that is in line with the Republican Party platform. The Republican voters in Hollis I have spoken with don't want biological men in women and girls bathrooms, locker rooms, or dressing rooms. They believe in local control and want our public schools in Hollis to provide a quality education that prepares students to enter the world successfully upon creation. They believe in the principles of fiscal restraint and strong stewardship of our tax dollars on both a local and state level. They want a government that serves them, not the other way around. And the final component is representation. The general court is comprised of citizens like you and I. A representative should be approachable and respond quickly to questions and concerns from the voters who put them in office, not just during election season. And that's it. Thank you for listening to me. Candidates. Thank you very much for your time. And welcome. Hollis Brookline High School, 7 to 7, Tuesday. That is correct. September is coming to voting time. I thank you, audience, for your time, your, your patience, and your participation. Candidates, give them a round of applause. And thank you, panelists, for your questions and your patience.